From the Kansas City Sports Update Studio, this is the Richard Smith Show, where we talk about all things Kansas City Chiefs, brought to you by Arrowhead Update. Don't forget to check out our Royals Update podcast with Kevin Mong. Check us out on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Speaker Player FM, YouTube, and all third-party applications. Also check us out on all major social media platforms. And if you can't find us there, just Google The Richard Smith Show and Kansas City Chiefs, and I promise you will find it. Let's talk Chiefs. How we doing, Chiefs Kingdom? One play at a time. One play at a time. That was Marty Ball. Definitely Marty Ball. It is Wednesday, May 29th, and we are here again to to talk Chiefs. Uh, I have Ryan Reed back with me today to talk uh, about the 1990s Kansas City Chiefs. How are we doing today, Ryan? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me back. Man, I'm happy to have you here. Happy to have you here. So what do you think, man? What do you think of Marty Ball? That was one of the things that I thought was the, the catalyst and the, the biggest driving home point of the 1990s Kansas City Chiefs um, was Marty Schottenheimer, man. He was the gears behind all of it. Oh, absolutely. Um, this is very nostalgic for me. The whole 90s were my teen years, early teens, and... Uh, these games, these memories, they they might actually be bigger in my head than they really were. But uh, yeah, these are some of the some of the best memories I had watching football with my dad, my brother. It, it, it's a great time for it was a great time to be a Chiefs fan. Uh, and, uh, and honestly, I think a lot of us agree with you in Chiefs Kingdom that I mean it really has been a turning point for our franchise leading up to where it is now because. I mean, before the 90s, the Chiefs were, were silent for years and years and years. And so <clears throat> it was nice to finally see uh, us bring in Schottenheimer and us turn that corner and bring in players like Derek Thomas and, and, and Neil Smith and, look, J.J. Burden, Percy Snow, um, Steve DeBerg, Nick Lowry, Kevin Ross, Albert Lewis. I mean, there's so many great names. that Deron Cherry. Uh, Dan Saliamua, I mean, and I know you could pick up where I'm leaving off here, you know. There's so many great names. We could be here a while listing them. Um, did you know you brought up Deron Cherry? He actually came to us as an unsigned free agent as a punter. Really? Yes. Wow. Yes, he did. Wow, that a is... Lot a lot of people... 
don't know that, but we actually signed him as a punter. Wow, that's amazing. I had no idea. I would have never seen him I threw as a you a punter. curveball. I apologize. No, I'm totally cool with that. Yeah, that's one of those things that, hey, you. I don't know where you dug that up from, but, man, I want your... I want your resources there. <laughs> so we're going to start with the 1990 Chiefs. And this is a Chiefs team that uh, ended the season 11-5 and and lost the wild card playoff um, game against the Miami Dolphins, um, which was a Dan Marino-led team. But we had several pro bowlers on that team as well. And that was really Mario Schottenheimer's first great year with the Chiefs. Man, what, what do you have to say about the 1990 season? It was, uh, like you said, the start of something big. Um, you know, Marty Ball can be taken as a a great thing or an insult. I guess it depends on who's looking at it. But uh, his running back by committee, uh, what was it, 90? We had Barry Word come in to the mix with uh, Akoye. Uh, it, was, it was a fun year. Um, one of the biggest things, Barry Word, I think that year, actually set a franchise record for the single season most uh, yards in a game. Um, what was it? 200 plus runnings. Uh, I'm sorry, 200 plus uh, rush yards against yeah against Detroit. But uh, that was a big win, 43 to 24. It started what probably would be what I said, the Marty Ball. We uh, we were a very strong running team, very strong running team. People feared our offense when you had players like Christian Okoye coming down that alley. Very word. So it was definitely an interesting time to be a Chiefs fan to start off with. And it was. And even even on the defensive side of the ball, that was um, that was the year that Derek Thomas had his uh, team record 20 sacks in, in one year. And also that was the seven-sack game year as well against the Seahawks. And we also had a record-setting 60 sacks on defense that year. But back to Derek Thomas, that seven-sack game. Let's talk about that. I really want to focus on that game because I think you know as well as I do, that's going to be really, really hard to top. Um, and when it comes down to it... I'll tell you... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, i tell you what, if I'll make you a deal. We'll talk about that game as long as we don't have to talk about the last five or six seconds. Yeah, <laughs> that was good. I was gonna say it was definitely the the eighth sack, the eighth sack that Derek Thomas will always regret. But that you know he was in the zone, he was in the zone, and and I've never seen a linebacker have a game like that where and he was having fun too. It wasn't just football; he was having fun. It was a great day. It was a great day at Arrowhead, or was that in Seattle? No, it was at Arrowhead. Uh, my mom and dad actually went to that game. Oh gosh, man! I know that was a that had to have been one of the greatest games ever, ever to attend. Um, but that record still stands today, and like I said, it's going to be tough to be broken. But I really wanted to focus on that and and talk about the seven sack game because that was just that was Derek Thomas's second year with the Kansas City Chiefs, and for him to have a twenty sack season and have seven sacks in one game. Um, Year two kind of sounds like uh, somebody we know here on the offensive side of the ball in Kansas City. Just, right. Just, he would be our he, – um, here's the deal in my thoughts. That game was amazing. But mm-hmm. I think it was it was a tough loss, but I think it, it really showed us who Derek Thomas was. He was a great athlete on the field. Um, you said he was in the zone that day. I think he was out of the world in this day. He was so good. But what got me was at the end of the game, it was that eighth sack that he didn't get. He set an NFL record for seven sacks in a game, and he come off like a, like a dog with the tail between his legs. It wasn't about the seven sacks to him, and I think that showed the Chiefs fans what we really got in this kid, the character, you know, and that's beyond the actual – physical specimen we saw on the field that day but that's what a good leader does that's what a good football player does and we learned a lot in that loss I think I absolutely think so too and and look I'll tell you what I I really think that's when him and look that was Marty's draft pick period Derek Thomas was Marty's draft pick that was his favorite draft pick he's ever had and he he looked at he looked at Derek as a son 
So, you know, I think that was a turning point for him, too, when he was like, uh, you, you were saying that the character behind Derek Thomas really shined right there. And, and everybody was like, OK, we have a superstar who can not only cares about uh, our football team, um, you know, but he cares about the football team more than his own personal stats. So that was that was a huge deal in Chiefs Kingdom that day. And, yeah, it was another turning point for the 90s for the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, we're talking the best defense in the 90s. The, the, the all-time winningest team in the 1990s was the Kansas City Chiefs. And that's a record that a lot of people overlook. And it's, it really, I really hate the fact that we didn't get over the hump in the AFC Championship and make it to a Super Bowl. But there's still a lot to bring to the table and bring home and be happy about with the 90s and the Kansas City Chiefs. Oh, absolutely. So, look, so we suffered the heartbreaking loss. Look, a lot of our... Well, let's be honest. As me and you being fans of the 1990s Chiefs and that really solidifying our role as fans uh, in Chiefs Kingdom, did we not go through the most crushing losses that you ever could go through in the 90s? I uh, don't think anybody can compare with our sadness. <laughs> your hopes are your hopes are so high with what you've seen in the whole regular season just to have them come crushing down like that it's just like what team did we put on the field sometimes um it's a little bit later but that buffalo game is a prime example of it you know especially with joe montana we'll get into that but uh yeah it, it it was so heartbreaking but at the same time you were always looking forward to next year yes but as i the chiefs fan i as a Chiefs fan, I think that's our logo. That should be our slogan. It should be underneath the big arrowhead sign. There's always next year. But uh, this this would definitely be the definition of that slogan for us. Man, I'll tell you what. You, you, you put, really put the nail in the coffin there as, as far as, as what the Chiefs were in, in the 90s because – Let's be honest, Chiefs Kingdom, what what um, Ryan just said was all of our thoughts every single year as a Chiefs, can, Chiefs fan, no matter if it was at the beginning of the year or the end of the year, it was there's always next year. And, and we live by that. And, and I think that we live by that all the way up through Alex Smith. And so now as a Chiefs fan, after going through all these heartbreaking losses in the 90s, we haven't even got into the 91 season yet, but <laughs> but we definitely have had some heartbreaks. But moving on to the 91 season, um, this is also the year that we fell short. Um, let's see. Was this the... I want to say... Let's see. Oh, the Raiders. We run against the Raiders. Houston. Was it Houston Oilers? Did we live not, lose 91 to the Houston Oilers in the playoffs? I'm losing my... No, I believe that was 90... Wait, wait, wait. It might have been... Hold on. I'm trying to think. I, I mean, I know our first, our first win was that uh, 93 game with uh, when we traveled to Houston, but that was with Montana. Oh well, moving on, moving on. Uh, yeah, I, I want think, to hold it well, up here. I think this is the thirty-seven to fourteen loss at Buffalo. Yeah, ninety-one but, was the year. Ninety-one, ninety-two was the uh, big loss at Buffalo. That's right, because Buffalo did go to the Super Bowl four years in a row. So that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so the ninety-one season really um, was a great season for the Chiefs too, because we we had turned the corner. And ninety, and hit the ninety one season, and we had a ten and six record to to end the season, and that was okay. So yes, that was a divisional playoff loss to the Bills, and we lost thirty seven to fourteen, and that was a heartbreaking loss for the Kansas City Chiefs because that was really our first year where we felt like we had a chance to at, at a serious Super Bowl, and uh, and our Pro Bowl. That was the also the first year that Neil Smith and Derek Thomas came together, and that was one of the biggest tandems in Chiefs history. Um, so that was a that was a huge catalytic year as far as the direction of our defense. Well, 
the attention, I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I did interrupt you, but the attention that Neil Smith brought on the other side of Derek Thomas, I understand, and you're right, that was probably one of the best tandems for Kansas City. I'll throw it out there. That might have been one of the best tandems that the NFL seen. They're not arguably, I mean, arguably one of the best. It, it was just amazing to watch that. It absolutely, and you're right. It was arguably one of the best ever, ever. And that was also a year where Percy Snow was drafted um, by the Kansas City Chiefs, which in my mind, I wish Percy would have had a better career with Kansas City, but early on it was looking good. And um, that was just, that was a year. And Dan Sally Mua, that was his really big turning point year as well because when you put Derek Thomas and Neil Smith on the ends and then we had Sally Mua stuffing up the middle, they're making so much noise on the ends. Dan Sally Mua was getting sacks, turnovers, touchdowns. I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, so it was... You know, we went on a, a four-game winning streak, um, and look, that was. And the crazy thing is about this four-game winning streak that year is we beat the Buffalo Bills in the regular season, smashed them, thirty-three to six. It was a Monday Night Football game, right? Yeah, we beat them thirty-three to six, and but we couldn't we couldn't get them in the playoffs. Couldn't get them in the playoffs. So, but look, that was a big year for Christian Okoye as well, Steve DeBerg. Um, at Barry Word, I, J.J. Burden is another big name. What about um, was that the year Steve DeBerg broke his finger? Oh, I remember that. Um, I believe it was. It was. It was as a kid watching Steve DeBerg walk out on that field with this gauze, or not gauze, but ace bandage all around his forearm, all the way down his hand, and three pins sticking out of his pinky finger. Lining up for a professional football game, that as a kid was the definition of tough to me. It, it, it stuck in my mind like it was yesterday. I, I've always had the world of respect for DeBerg just for that alone. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, me as a kid as well, uh, I have to feel the same. And I watched a video because um, I watched a little tape on DeBerg. And it was funny because what he said about it, he was like, I told myself if I was ever going to be able to play in a game with a broken bone, he was like, I always wanted to be the pinky finger on my non-throwing hand. And he said, what do you know? It was a pinky finger on my non-throwing hand. So he said, I don't care how bad it was. I was not going to be taken out of the season. So, and it was nasty. You remember, I don't know if you remember when they, when it happened, when he was in so much pain, like, oh man, I've never seen a guy besides Alex Smith. God bless him. Never seen a guy in so much pain um, on the field. And that was a pinky. I mean, that thing was nasty. So look, we had a pro bowler that year as a kicker. Uh, Nick Lowry, I love Nick Lowry. That was that was the classic uh, one bar kicker. You know, he had the one bar on his on his helmet on the right. on his face mask. A little and, standalone mustache. Yeah, dude, he was like one of the last guys to really rock that look, and that was cool. And that would look John Alt. That was really the start of our great offensive line. Um, Will Shields hadn't even been brought to the picture yet at this point. Um, so John Alt, that was he was the the catalyst, the the centerpiece um, and the cornerstone of our great offensive line that started in 1992. And like I said, we lost. Okay, so 91, 92. Okay, I moved on to 93 mm -hmm. here. So yeah, moving on to 93. 93, we went 10 and 6 as well, and we lost the wild card playoff to the Chargers. Um, I always hate losing. A playoff game uh, to a divisional rival. That's 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 horrible. I couldn't imagine um, me being a player and losing like that. Um. So what would be? Now, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. That, yeah, that was uh, that was tough. Um, that was the year we had Craig starting, right? Yes. Or at least he made it up to the playoffs. Craig was, I, he was already on his downhill. And I think that was a last-ditch effort to just kind of plug and play a quarterback, hoping our defense and our running game would just be enough to get us to that next step. And unfortunately, I don't think it was. No. Uh, but 
I think that might have uh, helped lead into the following season when we did one of the most amazing things and probably one of the most memorable things, memorable things that Chiefs Kingdom has ever seen. And look, I want to move on to that season because, look, 92 was not really anything to speak of. That was really probably Stefan Page's coming out year, and and Albert Lewis had some good years. Look, I want to do, I do want to say one thing about Albert Lewis and the early 90s. Did, did you all know that Albert Lewis had four block punts in one year for the Kansas City Chiefs? That's huge. Not to sound, not to sound like a know-it-all, but yes, I did. I still watch old uh, YouTube videos and clips of uh, rebroadcasted games, so uh, I did relearn that just shortly after. But he'd come around the outside corner, and he just—it was like nobody even knew he was on the field, untouched. And he—he's had some big game-changing block punts. He, he was something else. Yeah, yeah, he really was, man. He was a, a great, a great piece to our defense and special teams. Now, in this 1993 season, look, this was a historic season for the Kansas City Chiefs, and in my mind, one of the greatest seasons, or the next two seasons of all time for the Chiefs. Um, Look, that's when we brought in Joe Montana and Marcus Allen. So, when you bring in Broadway Joe Montana, (laughs) well, Joe... Montana, whatever you think, that dude's got so many nicknames. But when you bring in a man like that, regardless if he's at the end of his career, he still had time in him, just like when the Broncos brought in Peyton Manning. And so we looked at that as really fixing the band-aids that we were putting on the Kansas City Chiefs as far as quarterbacks for the last few years. Um, what was you, What's your take on Joe Montana coming to the Chiefs that year? Growing up, like I said, a big Chiefs fan, but you couldn't help but peek over to the 49er games and watch Joe Montana. He was amazing. The moment we found out that we pulled him over to Kansas City, it was surreal. Uh, It was one of those pinch me in my dreaming things. No way does he come from California, the 49ers, to Kansas City. It just, you know, in what world? But they made it happen. He had gas left in the tank, like you said. And I think he had a lot to prove because Steve Young took his place. And they're kind of like, you know, kicked him to the curb. You might be able to back up or whatever. But I think he had a lot to prove, and he did. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he made some of the most memorable plays in Chiefs history. Um, you know, one I'm going to bring one up against the, the Denver Broncos. Uh, the magic was that what well, I can't remember what, remember what they called that. The man. Monday night magic. Monday night magic. Yeah, Joe Montana brought us back in, in under two minutes and uh, connected with Anthony Davis in, in the end zone with eight seconds left to, to really seal that game and watch watch John Elway's face and jaw just like, hit the ground. Well, really hurt was John Elway actually scored with you know, a little under two minutes left, and all of Cheese Kingdom immediately sunk. Our hearts dropped. He did it to us again. And all of a sudden, you see Mr. Montana walk out with the most cool look on his face, and it's like, you know what? We got this. I, I, I'm going to speak for myself, but I, I bet a lot of other people felt the same way at that moment. Watching him lead his team, it was like, it's okay. We got Joe. We got this. That feeling instantly went away, and... What he did, we hadn't seen before against L.A. in Denver Monday night. It was just one of the greatest we've ever seen. Absolutely, and it really was a a huge game, too. Look, that had big playoff implications in that game. That wasn't early in the season, um, and it was because it was a December game. And so it was just really nice to see us finally hone in and, and be able to have some confidence in our offense because, man, uh, my whole life before that, it had been a jungle on the offensive side of the ball. Well, you know, you push it back. We've always had that nightmare with Elway, but even before Marty came to Kansas City, those Broncos had his number. At Cleveland, they had his number. He comes to Kansas City, they had his number. So that win had to be huge for Marty, too. 
Hey, very true. Very true. And I'll tell you what, another guy that that was a great season for who really got left in the dust for Bo Jackson um, was Marcus Allen. So it was really nice when Marcus Allen say, sat the bench for two years in Oakland. Whatever that personal thing was between between him and uh, what's his name? Al Davis. Al Davis. Yeah, the personal vendetta Al Davis had out against Marcus Allen. I love seeing him come to the Chiefs and just run it down Al Davis's throat because he really, really had a solid year or two with Kansas City. And, and that was nice, too, because, look, we were on a transition from Okoye to, to Barry Word, and we really didn't know the direction of running back. So it was kind of a, a steal for us for an Al Davis blunder that really turned out to bite him in the butt anyway because – no matter how good Bo Jackson was, he didn't last. So he probably would have got a lot more production out of a Marcus Allen if he would have kept him starting, but I also understand the Bo Jackson side of things. Right. Yeah, Bo Jackson was one of those players Kansas City hated him in the fall but loved him in the spring. Yeah. He was he was an exceptional athlete. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And I want to say that 1993, I want to bring this name up because he was one of my favorite players. I think that was James Hasty's first year with the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, and it was really... Wow, there's a name I haven't heard in a while. Yes. Mr. James Hasty. And, and I loved James Hasty. He was a great, great piece to our defensive side. I mean, and we don't want to forget people like Jerron Cherry. Um, but it's just... The the James Hasties need their need their credit because that's one that you would overlook and forget. Um, kind of like a Kevin Ross. I love Kevin Ross and Albert Lewis, but those names, I mean, uh, they were all around the same time, and there was some big things going on in offense, and and really on the def- defensive side of the ball, <clears throat> you couldn't take your eyes off of Derek Thomas. It didn't matter what was going on in the rest of the field. We had Derek Thomas, so those players get overlooked. But I want to touch base with them real quick. So. This was really the first year in the 90s where we won our division. We won a wild card game against the Steelers, 27 to 24. We won the AFC Divisional Playoff um, to the Houston Oilers, which was a huge deal in Kansas City. I don't know if a lot of people remember how bad the Houston Oilers had the Kansas City Chiefs number in the in the early 90s and the late 80s. But I'll tell you what, that Moore Moon led team was amazing and I can't what was their running back that, Earl Campbell well that run and shoot offense they ran uh, it, it was just so new nobody could figure out how to defend it um, earlier that year I might be wrong but I think Houston at the very beginning of the season or at least midway through had already beat us something like 30 to nothing at Arrowhead yes so going into Houston in such a big game that atmosphere already having them smacked us once in the year that game was awesome just to just to come back and win it like we did it, it really was uh it was a Keith Cash catching that touchdown pass, finding that buddy Ryan poster in the corner of the end zone and just pegging it with the football. That was awesome. I love that too. And Buddy Ryan, God rest his soul. Look, man, I'm I love I love Buddy Ryan. He was a, a I wouldn't want to say a class act. He was one of a kind. He was one of a kind. The cowboy hat, the whole thing. I mean, and it reflects with Rex and and the other Ryan. I mean, that that family's just a great family, but. Look, it was awesome, awesome to see us get over that hump with the Oilers because that was a huge monkey on the Kansas City Chiefs' back. So then we go on to the AFC Championship well, game. Yeah. And that's at Buffalo. You know, we knew that we were going to have to go to Buffalo. That was the team to beat and had been the team to beat. And um, look, we looked flat. I don't know. I don't know what it was about that game. Uh, did Joe Montana get hurt in that game? I believe he had a concussion early in the game. Um, offensively for the Bills, it was the Thurman Thomas show. We, we couldn't find an answer for him. And it was frustrating. It's so bad in the first half, they actually sat Derek Thomas, of all people, the second half, trying to adjust to that Buffalo offense. It was crazy. And what? 
that, you know, as a Chiefs fan, we're all like, what are you doing? But you know you're grasping at straws when you take arguably the best defensive player in the league and you sit him on the bench to try and stop an offense like that. So hats off to Buffalo, but, yeah, they broke our heart that year. They did, man. And, I mean, it wasn't just Thurman Thomas, Andre Reed. I mean, he he was a great receiver, and, I mean, he torched Absolutely. us. Absolutely, and I'm not taking away from Jim Kelly. Uh, that Buffalo defense, Bruce Smith, they, they, uh, Daryl Talley, I believe, played on oh, that. wow. That was a great all-around team. My personal memory was the Thurman Thomas show in that game. It, it, he was the reason – we just looked lost on defense. Yeah, and they smoked us. That was a that was thirty to thirteen. That was a heartbreak because, look, there wasn't a point in that game where it looked like Kansas City had any chance. And and I'll never forget that. And it was really look that game made you you couldn't wait for nineteen ninety four even before that game was over with. <laughs> on that note, and I want to tell you something because this is big and this shows what kind of fans we have as Chiefs. That year, after Buffalo had just annihilated us, my mom got me and my brother, and we figured out what time they were going to land in KCI Airport. Yeah, I went too. We drove all the way up from uh, Peculiar, Missouri, thinking that there wouldn't be a whole lot of people there, and we might get to meet some of them, tell them, great job, great season. I would tell you that there were over 10,000 cars doing the same thing. We couldn't even get into the airport. It was amazing the support that the Chiefs fans gave that team coming home for such a heartbreaking loss. But you're exactly right. It had us. We were looking forward to next year. A lot to be proud of and a lot to come in the future. You know, honestly, I think I went to the airport after that game, too, because the one thing I remember is going to the airport for the Chiefs coming home from a playoff loss and me on top of my mom's shoulders in the airport and somebody standing on her ankle and we had to take her to the hospital. So I remember that. That might have been the very, that might have been the same game because it was a playoff loss and and that was my memory of sitting on my mom's shoulders and all that stuff happening. But we were there at one of those uh, um, welcome home (laughs) events as well, which you didn't even know was an event. I think we all turned it into an event. (laughs) Exactly. So we'll move on um, to the to ninety four and ninety five season. We'll kind of keep these a little bit more brief because we're running running out of time here. But that was the ninety four season. Was what was that Joe Montana's last season with the Kansas City Chiefs? Because there's two seasons. I believe so because he announced his retirement in ninety five. Okay, so and that year the Chiefs went nine and seven. We finished second in AFC West. Um, we did make the playoffs, uh, which that was something that was pretty much locked and set in stone every season in the 90s for the Kansas City Chiefs. But again, we couldn't get over the Dolphins either. The Dolphins beat us that year 27-17. to 17. Um, And again, Neil Smith, Derek Thomas were pro bowlers. Uh, Dale Carter was coming into his prime. Um, I was a big Dale Carter fan. Me too, me too. And I'll tell you what, I think my favorite season for Dale Carter was 97. And that was also another heartbreaking season. I think I want to move into that season because 96 was a great season too. And I will say 96 was the season that the Chiefs were predicted to win the Super Bowl. Um, It was in Sports Illustrated. That was the first time the Chiefs were ever predicted. And that was an Elvis Gerback-led team, Um, which we we didn't live up to par and... And 96, um, 95 was a Steve Bono led team. Oh. We went to the playoffs, lost to the Colts. Exactly. Um, that was a 13 and three, three, uh, season. That was the year Steve Bono had like that 96 yard touchdown run against Oakland. The, the longest quarterback. It was 86. 80. It was 86 yards against the Arizona Cardinals. Was it that? Might, yeah. I believe the Arizona, it was the Cardinals for sure. But, yeah, and you've got uh, – I can't remember the lineman that was with him, but you, you watch this lineman, wide open field, slowing down for Bono can catch up and possibly pass him so he can actually block somebody. And that, that, that was hilarious. But, yeah, he did that naked bootleg, and he was, I guess, off to the races. Hey, there's <laughs> – yeah, I don't know how somebody did not catch up with him. But this is – I will say – 
the 1995 season, I said I want to keep this brief, when we lost the divisional playoffs to the Colts 10-7, to that was the Kimball Anders year. That was the year Kimball Anders really came out and showed us something, and we thought we had a future in him. Um, and look, he looked great. That was a 1,000-yard season. Um, I really thought we had a future in Kimball Anders because the next year in 96, he did the same thing. Um, it came out. That was a 9-7 and seven season. Um, that was the one year. Well, two years maybe the Chiefs didn't make the playoffs in the 90s. I believe you are correct on that. Was it nine and seven? We missed it. Yeah, we missed it in ninety six for sure. So ninety five was the supposed to be our Super Bowl run. Okay, so then we move on to nineteen ninety seven. I said we fly through ninety five and ninety six because they weren't really that great of seasons for the Kansas City Chiefs. But look, this is moving in, moving on to the Andre Risen, Elvis Gerback era in Kansas City. A 13-3 and three season, mind you. We won the AFC West, but we lost the Broncos in the playoffs. And that's that's when James... This season... I think... Uh, I think a lot of Chiefs fans might agree with me on this. This season should have been the season. The one thing that we did that kept us from getting to the big game... I, I honestly believe in my heart it was picking Gerbach over Gannon. Absolutely. I think if we would have gambled with Gannon, we might have had it that year. Gannon was a franchise quarterback. I don't know what we were thinking. I know Gannon or Gannon was older, but look what he went. Look what he went and did in Oakland. And yeah, but he turned around and he, he won a Super Bowl for the for the Raiders of all people. Yeah, and how what a big. What a big kick in the balls of Chiefs Kingdom that was. I mean, and we kept a we kept a quarterback that look. It was another gift from San Francisco, and we thought we had something there because they moved on from Gerback, and they had uh, God, I can't remember the little short guy's name out there at San Francisco, Jeff Garcia. Oh, uh, the redheaded guy, Jeff Garcia. Yeah. Yep. So they moved on from Gerback. We should have known right then. You move on from Elves Gerback to give the ball uh, to Jeff Garcia. I mean. <laughs> Come on, Kansas City. That should have been a huge sign right there that we're barking up the wrong tree. But right. that was probably James Hasty's breakout year with Dale Carter, Derek Thomas, um, and that whole crew. That was one of the best defensives in the 90s, if you ask me, was you know the 97 Chiefs. Um, we were shutting people out. Wasn't that the run we went on where there wasn't an offensive touchdown scored against the Chiefs? The entire second half of the game for like three quarters of the season. I think you're right about that. That's the uh, that's the game we were actually talking about. Me and you, and probably the few days that thirty to nothing shutout in Oakland or against Oakland. Mm-hmm. That was '97 too, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Ooh, yes, you're and absolutely Oakland right. Oakland wasn't a bad team. Hey, that was that was hey that was awesome. That was also the Andre Risen year. That this year is the the Monday Night Football game when Andre Risen caught the Elvis Gerback pass for like sixty yards, a sixty yard touchdown with time running out on Monday Night Football, and and that was that was a huge deal. Andre Risen come to Kansas City from Atlanta. Andre Bad Mood Risen. <laughs> yes, yeah, Spider Man. He was a lot of fun to watch. He really was, especially behind. The, you know the the offensive line that we still had. You know our quarterback had plenty of time to stand in the pocket and let him get downfield, and that was a that was a that was probably the first time in my life as a Chiefs fan where I really thought we had an awesome wide receiver playing for the Chiefs. Right now, some might some might correct you on that. Stephon Page had a good following. Yes, he was. Uh... He was. I, I, I remember him vaguely because I was pretty young. He was. My, my father was a very big fan of Stephon Page. And and don't me. And that's the, that's the thing is, you know, I'm young enough to the point where Steve Deberg and that little era was really the starting point of my memory with the Chiefs. So Stephon right. Stephon Page, you know, I know who he is, but you know, JJ Burden was the guy who I remember uh, watching when I first started watching the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, right. So with the 1997 season, look, it, we lost to the Broncos in the playoffs. But here's the thing: just but we lost to him in the divisional round, and we had the first round by 
uh, because we won the AFC West and we were first in the AFC. That was the year of Terrell Davis and uh, John Elway. That was their Super Bowl year, 1997. And uh, did they do back-to-back, 97-98? That is correct. So... I believe that, yeah, I believe that was both the Elways. And that was and that was the thing is these are these were one of, you know one of two years in the '90s where we really really felt like we had a chance to to make a Super Bowl run and the Broncos spoiled it for us because we could not stop Terrell Davis no matter what how good our defense was Terrell Davis would absolutely run down our throats and that was tough to watch. I think he ran down everybody's throats. Terrell Davis was uh, was definitely a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. And it hurts to watch him just run up and down the field. And every time you see him take off, a little bit of your heart just breaks a little more. You're like, oh boy, yep. it's happening again. Yep, and it would too, every single time. And so look, here's the thing. is, in 1997 season, in my mind, was really the beginning of the end of a dynasty for the Kansas City Chiefs. And it was tough to watch because that's really when our pieces started breaking up and and heading to other teams uh neil smith left um that was that was the year that i i think we only had spider-man for that that last year we had him like two or three years and it was kimball anders was on his way out um james james dale carter was on his way out that like i mean there were so many players um what that's the year neil smith went to denver um, it just, it was a tough year for Kansas City. And you knew Marty Schottenheimer was starting to look at the Chiefs as, as something of the past. And so, and that really reflected when we went into the next season and everything just fell apart. Everything fell apart in 1998. Yeah, uh, that was real frustrating. Um, it, the build up all the way to the 93 94 season. As a Chiefs fan, you're like, oh, my God, it's here. We're going to do it, but it's a now or never. We don't know how much Joe, Joe Montana is going to you know, have left in the tank after the season. So we got to do it now. It doesn't happen. We're like, well, our defense is looking real good. A few years later, we're there again. It's all or nothing. And we fell short again. And like you said, that last time is about when we started to deteriorate. And it was just... You know, it was a hopeless feeling. I will say that's one thing we have right now is we've got a hope for a long future. We don't have to say it has to be now or never. It's going to be now and then again. So that's one thing that's neat about this Chiefs team. Yes, and and I, and I agree with you. We're good for the next 10 to 15, and we've never had that feeling in Chiefs Kingdom because, you know, just like we touched base on last uh, you know, just a little bit ago, we said that, you know, with the Chiefs in the 90s, you know, ne- there's always next year. That was our that was our quote. And that was what we stood by. But it always it, there was always such an urgency in my mind. And I know that it, the Chiefs in Chiefs Kingdom, we all everybody felt like this when we had a chance. We felt like that was our only chance. And, and so that's why it hurts so bad for Chiefs Kingdom is because it was that deep. I mean, we thought, you know, when Joe Montana came, hey, this is our only shot and we don't know when we're going to get it again. And it's been 20 years, you know, 25, 30 years, actually. So it was heartbreaking because we felt like we were, you know, on our last string. And look at us now. Look at us now. And I, I love that's a great point. A great point. So. This is really when the offensive line started falling apart as well. Our defense started falling apart. We're losing quarterbacks. Marty Schottenheimer's getting to the point where he wants to move on from the Kansas City Chiefs. The 1998 season was really a turning point and kind of put us in a rut. Um, so, actually, you know, after the 1998 season, that is when Marty Schottenheimer moved on to the San Diego Chargers because... The 1999 season, Marty Schottenheimer was a San Diego Charger. Um, That's right. He he took that Charger team to the next level. Yes, and then so then we bring in Gunther Cunningham. We also bring in Tony Gonzalez. 
Um, that was the first. That's right. That's the first year Tony Gonzalez um, is a Kansas City Chief, and that's really one of the last years Tim Grunhard and like Dave Zott and all those guys, um, you know, are, are together as an offensive line, and, and Will, Will Shields as well. Um, we finished nine and second, or nine and second, nine and seven. We did not make the playoffs. Look, Gunther Cunningham, God rest his soul. Um, you. You're great. We're a great defensive coordinator, but a horrible coach. <laughs> horrible coach. I did not like Gunther as a head coach. Uh, he wasn't ready for it. He was a defensive genius, but that's about as far as it goes. I agree. He, he loved him on defense, but it was like, boy. Um, another one that we we went through, in my opinion, that I felt very similar was uh, Romeo Cremel. I loved him as our defensive coordinator, but when we let Todd Haley go and they moved him up, uh, it was uh, that was heartbreaking because you knew at the end of that season they were going to replace him as head coach, and when they do that, they lost Romeo altogether. That was tough to see. Yeah, yeah, and and it was. And I'll tell you what, touching base on on the coaching staff, I do want to say like we had coaches on our coaching staff in the early '90s that people forget about, like Bill Cower. Um, Tony Dungy was on our coaching staff in the early 90s. Um, Denny yeah, Green. He was a DB coach, right? Yes. And I mean, I, th- I want to say Denny Green. Uh, there, there's some really big time names that circulated through the Kansas City Chiefs organization that a lot of people overlooked because they weren't big names with the Chiefs. It was early on in their career. But uh, Marty Schottenheimer, a lot of people complained about Marty Ball. But in my mind, to this day still, he's the best Kansas City Chiefs coach to ever step on the field. And I still tip, tip the hat uh, to him over Andy Reid at this point. It's getting close. It's getting well, very close. It, it's not just an opinion. It's a fact. He is the winningest coach in Kansas City's history. Uh, 101 wins, 58 losses, one tie. It's backed up by numbers, what you just said. He is the most winning coach in Kansas City history. Absolutely. And and Andy Reid still has another four years to catch up to those numbers. Do I think he will? Yes. Do I think Andy Reid is going to be the winningest Kansas City Chiefs coach of all time when it's said and done? Yes. I'm going to give him that because Mahomes is the guy to get him over that hump as well. Um, there's a lot riding on the Kansas City Chiefs, it's there's a lot of personal stuff. There's a lot of community things. There's a lot of things in the organization. I mean, everybody that's involved in this right now, it's chomping at the bit for a championship, and I love it. Yes, their mentality is not let's go get the Super Bowl. Let's go get it because it's ours, not because we're a good team, but we. We, it's owed to us, and I love that attitude. Love it. They they already have that trophy in their head. It, it's ours. We're just going to go get it now. Yep. Uh, Kelsey's one of the biggest, and I love his little bit of arrogance when he talks about it. You know, and I think I think our team needs Kelsey in that in that sense. Just a little chip on his shoulder. Dude, I love the chip on his shoulder. That's the biggest. I love that. It's the it compliments. Our Chiefs offense so well because he's a leader and and above everything he's a good person. So when you have a leader and a good person, somebody who's uh, who has the trust of every player on his team and every person in the community, you can have that chip on your shoulder. And then that chip on your shoulder turns into a positive thing for your team instead of an Antonio Brown. So and that's really the difference. That is the the foundation and the fundamentals of you know really the family atmosphere with Kansas City. So we're getting off subject a little here. Let's get back to the '90s. Um, I'm going to touch base on one thing briefly. This is something that look it wasn't in the '90s. It was shortly after is 2000, uh, February 8th to be exact. Uh, Derek Thomas uh, left this earth. Left Chiefs Kingdom. With shattered hearts and 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 wondering what the future was for Kansas City, and you made up a good point off air the other day, is you know, and I don't know, it might have been on air, is Derek Thomas was a hero in a lot of people's minds in Kansas City, pretty much everybody's. And as a kid, when your hero dies, like that's when I, you know, a lot of us in Chiefs Kingdom knew that life was real, and and so 
with that being said, man, Derek Thomas, God rest your soul, your hero, Chiefs legend. What's your take on on Derek Thomas, uh, Ryan? Well, he uh, we touched on it earlier. His uh, sorry, you, you get me with this one a little bit. Let me clear my throat. There's a frog. He, we touched on his athleticism and just how dominating he was as a uh, defensive player. Uh, it's beyond that. The things he did for the community, he was always involved. Uh, you know, I know we've all seen the Football Life show, and to learn how much he loved his kids and how, you know, it, not just his kids, the situation where he went, spent, I think, one of his Nike contracts and took care of every inner city kid's uh, library fees one year. And it's just the guy was the third and long foundation. He, he was genuinely a good guy. My, uh, I, my father actually got to meet him in person a few times. Kansas City's a big, small town. Yes. Um, and he'll be the first to tell you, one of the most genuinely nice men you'll ever meet. Just an all-around great person. So as much as we love to see what he did on the field, I think what defines him is what he did off the field. Yes, absolutely. And and I will say this, you we are correct when we say that Derek Thomas is a Chiefs legend. And Derek Thomas is the greatest Chief to ever put on a Chiefs uniform. But I will say one thing. Behind every great player is a great coach. And Marty Schottenheimer is the epitome of of Kansas City Chiefs in the 1990s. Everything that was the Chiefs was was Marty Schottenheimer. And everything that was Marty Schottenheimer was Derek Thomas because that was that was Marty's pick. That was Marty's draft pick. I said it earlier. He loved Derek just like all of us did. And so with that being said, Kansas City, we want to take you back a little bit to the 90s and the Coach Schottenheimer era because it was one of the greatest in the history of Chiefs football and, and really – probably set the tempo for where the Kansas City Chiefs organization is right now. If it wasn't for the 1990s Chiefs, there would not be this organization that we have right now. The nucleus, the family that is Chiefs Kingdom was started in the 90s. Absolutely. I think that's the biggest one is the the, the Kingdom. The Kingdom was started in the 90s. Yes, and I want to bring up a point that you mentioned that we uh, off air that you said you wanted to bring up. We do have the record for the loudest stadium in the NFL, and we did set it against the Seattle Seahawks. I want you to go ahead and bring up the point that you okay. brought up to me off the line and tell Chiefs Kingdom what your personal belief is about that record and what could have possibly happened in the 90s. All right. We did talk about this, and I, I, might, I might upset a few of these uh, younger fans because that is definitely something to be proud of. I'm not going to take away from it, 142.2. That's amazing. I'm willing to say that there are two games, at least two games, where that record would have been broken if they would have recorded decibels back then, or at least in those games. I believe that Monday night showdown when Buffalo came into town and we just stomped them, that was one game that I believe was over 142 decibels. I remember watching it on TV, and you couldn't even see the time clock in the bottom screen for the uh, snap count. You couldn't see it because it was a blur. That that stadium was just rocking so much. And who can forget John Elway crying in the back of his own end zone to the refs? These fans are just so loud, I can't hear. I got to tell you. I wish we were. I wish we were able to record those two games because I do think it would have beat one hundred and forty-two point two. Man, I'll tell you what, dude. That that stadium was rocking those times that you're talking about, and and I know from personal experience, and I like I know it. Look, there were times where that stadium was vibrating. I mean, they said they could feel it. The players said they could feel it underneath their feet. John Elway's crying. The fans literally got a warning from. Did we? I don't think we got penalized, but we got a warning from the official telling us we need to quiet down or that we we're going to get a delay a game penalty. We were that loud. For any of you that have never been to Arrowhead Stadium, when he says that the stadium is vibrating, 
understand this stadium is built of concrete. Yes. This isn't aluminum bleachers. Yes. This isn't, you know, steel floors that you walk on. This is a concrete stadium they had moving. Yeah, so this is this is about a, a 60-year-old stadium, you know, that, that they have rocking, moving, shaking, vibrating, I mean, pounding the back of seats, anything we possibly can do to make noise and, and disrupt the other team or cheer for our team. And it's, it's a great thing. And anybody who's never been to Arrowhead, if you're listening to this broadcast, look, we love all the fans out there. But I got to tell you this, you need to go to Arrowhead and you need to make it a priority, especially in this Patrick Mahomes era, because you're you're seeing a dynasty and you're seeing you're seeing a kid you might not ever see, you might not ever see any type of talent like this again in the NFL, and it's at Arrowhead Stadium, right where it deserves to be, back home. Let's bring the Lombardi Trophy home. I love the '90s, but we're sitting here with the greatest quarterback possibly of all time. So, hey. Ryan, it was great to have you on the show again today. We're going to end the broadcast. We're coming up on an hour here. I figured we would. My friend, I figured it would be about an hour show here. But, look, it was great reflecting with you in the 90s. There's some great memories, man. I brought up some smiles. And and not just memories of football, but family memories, friends' memories. You know, when you bring up times 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it's hard not to reflect on you know, the personal aspects of your life as well and the things that were going on in Chiefs Kingdom outside of football. Um, so, man, it was a pleasure. Ryan, I appreciate you coming on. Oh, man, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you having me. It's always a good time talking football with you, my friend. Heck, yeah, same to you, man. Well, look, you have a great day. I'm going to let you get off to your day. And uh, Chiefs Kingdom, that's the broadcast for today as well. I hope you all had a great Memorial Day weekend. Um uh, get to work. It's, it's hump day. You got a few days left to work, Kansas City. Um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, this is the Richard Smith Show, where we talk about all things Kansas City Chiefs. Um, we're here at the Kansas City Sports Update Studios, brought to you by Arrowhead Update. Uh, check us out on iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Spotify. Uh, YouTube, Player FM, and all third-party applications. Also check us out on all major social media platforms. And if you cannot find us there, just Google The Richard Smith Show and Kansas City Chiefs, and I promise you will find us. Have a great day, Kansas City.